this welder was found sitting in a field and I restored it and got it working again. It's a Miller Thunderbolt 225 from the 1990s. So it's at least 30 years old, older than me. <laughs> it was rusty, ugly, and hard to adjust. Um, it also had loose connections and was overheating because the fan was missing. It also had no grounding clamp. The first thing I did was disassemble it to see what was wrong and see how it works. Here's the parts diagram from the manual I found online. On the front of the unit, we have the power switch, the receptacles for the welding electrodes, and the output level indicator. On the back is where the power cable plugs into the wall, into a wall socket. On top of the welder, there's a handle to move the shunt up and down, which controls the output amps of the welder. The inside of the welder contains the fan, and fan motor at the bottom which cools down two coils and the shunt which controls the output power. The indicator is attached to the shunt and shows through the front of the unit so that you can see how many amps you have it set to. This is the electrical diagram from, from the manual. The two hot conductors are shown as black and white and the ground is green which is standard coloring for all AC cabling. Then there is a switch then there are the shunt and coils. Then there are the electrode plugs for the welding electrodes, which includes the work electrode receptacle, also known as ground or negative, and the high and low receptacles. Modern we welders usually just have one positive electrode, but this old welder has two receptacles for high and low, depending on if you need above or below 150 amps. The thicker the metal you are welding, the higher amps you need to melt the metal. The welder originally comes with a NEMA 650P plug that plugs into the wall. The 650P plug has three conductors, two hots and a ground, but no neutral. The two 120 volt legs combine to create 220 volts. By the way, when talking about voltage ratings of electrical components, for 110, 115, 120, and 125 all refer to the same nominal voltage. Word nominal means by name only, so the precise voltage of the component will be different, but within the ballpark of 120. The same applies when you're talking about nominal voltages of 220 or 240 volt, or even 12 volt, 24 volt, and 48 volt systems found in RV and off-grid applications. I replaced the 650P plug with a 1450P plug. There are multiple reasons for this. The first being to power the fan motor. After welding a new fan bushing onto a scrap fan from the junkyard, the fan motor was ready for operation. It just needed to be, it just needed to be wired first. The original fan motor was 220 volt, so it could just be wired directly to the black and white at the back of the power switch on the welder. All I had available to me was the 120 volt fan motor, therefore I needed a neutral conductor to power the new fan motor since 120 volt at a minimum requires a hot and a neutral. Here's the diagram for NEMA plugs. We went from this type of plug to this type of plug for the welder. While the old 650P plug and the new 1450P plug are both 220 volt, the new plug includes four conductors instead of three so we can use the neutral because the neutral is not being used by the welder we can use the neutral for to power the new 120 volt fan motor in this case i had to add a regular common 120 volt 14 3 wire along the length of the power cable for the welder i then had to tap into one of the hots of the 1450 plug and steal the neutral, which then powers the fan. So the fan gets one hot, one neutral in, in the ground, and the welder gets two hots and a ground. So the welder is 220 volt, and the fan is 120 volt. The fan ground is simply wired to the chassis of the welder, as well as the welder ground. The second reason to use a 1450P plug is that it's common 
four RV 50 amp plugs. When you plug in your RV to a 50 amp socket at a campground, um, it uses a 1450p plug. So this means the plug receptacle and extension cord that I had to buy to get this welder usable could be reused for other purposes. I like things to have multiple purposes when I buy them. So now I have a 25 foot extension cable that works for the welder and plugging in to a 50 amp RV socket at a campground to charge my batteries. This is the back of the power switch. The black and white conductors are attached here. The wires then go to the shunt of the welder which controls the output amps. The shunt cracked and broke due to rust debris and weak design of the part. After doing all of this work to the welder and finding, of course, this part is not in existence anymore, I spent hours 3D modeling and printing prototype parts at the library until eventually settling on this design. I designed the part in two identical pieces that fit together since they have to be bolted together lengthwise after a small cube on the threaded rod is set between them. That is how the shunt adjustment moves. The handle is spun, which screws a fixed threaded rod that is inserted through the cube. It is an awkward, weak design, prone to failure. The manual on the welder calls for disassembling the welder on a regular basis to apply grease to this, just to avoid it breaking. This part gets very hot and standard 3D printing filament will not cut, cut it because the part exploded when I used the welder um, when using regular 3D, print, uh, 3D printer filament. The original part was made of some type of fiberglass which is weak for this application but could at least withstand temperature. I researched the materials that could withstand higher temperatures and found nylon PA12 this can withstand up to 182 degrees Celsius or 360 Fahrenheit. I found the company Sculptio and being the hopeless victim of sunken cost fallacy that I am, shelled out the $150 to get it 3D printed in nylon PA12 from Sculptio. The part worked and the remaining electrical work was with the electrodes. The receptacles for the electrodes were very loose. That was just a matter of rebolting down the connections inside on each of the receptacles. While I was at it, I cleaned up the coils and all the metal inside, removing as much rust as I could. And then I also attached a new grounding clamp to the negative electrode, also called the work or ground electrode. And the last step was to clean everything up and reassemble it. While removing the rust from the chassis, I messed up my leg pretty bad with the wire wheel on the angle grinder, and this is the scar two years later. That was when I was just a novice with the angle grinder. Anyway, after cleaning the surface and painting, this is the final result of the welder. The first thing I welded was the cart for the welder that I made out of an old wine rack and scrap metal. I had to buy the wheels axle and cotter pin for the wheels. I also put some tools on it, including the slag hammer, gloves, welding stick case, metal files, clamps, tool tray, uh, angle grinder, grinding wheels, and a welding mask. So everything you need to use a stick welder. And these are some of the things that I've welded so far on the trailer conversion. Um, here I'm welding the ceiling for extra support to mount the solar panel brackets because there would be a few extra, a few hundred extra pounds on the roof just for the six solar panels and hardware and also the fan and antenna and um, also have to walk on the roof frequently.
This is the rear door of the trailer that I welded backing plates to the frame so I could securely mount the license plate, spare tire mount, and two swing down jacks in order to use the door as a patio. Getting a working welder and learning how to use it was absolutely necessary to complete this trailer build. And here's my friend trying to do a weld and complaining about the angles. 